Sergeants, you may begin your recordings. PC recording has started. Recording to the clouds, all set. Sergeant Hanna, you may begin with your opening statement. Okay. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Civil and Human Rights. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their videos? Once again, at this time, can please, all panelists, panelists please turn on their videos? Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silence. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Matthew. Sorry. Good morning. My name is Matthew Eugene. I'm the chair of the Civil and Human Rights Committee. Thank you for joining our virtual hearing today on the New York City Commission on Human Rights Response to COVID-19. Before we begin, I would like to uh, I don't know, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, but I will do so as we go on through the uh, hearing. In December, 2020, a new coronavirus was discovered in Huan, China. On March 2020, New York State Governor Como, Andrew Como confirmed the first case of novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, also known as COVID-19 in New York City. The spread of the virus has had and continues to have numerous ramifications and affected the life of New Yorkers from all walks of life. To date, there have been 259, 64 positive cases of coronavirus in New York City. 23,935 of these cases have tragically ended in the loss of our fellow New Yorkers. The pandemic gave rise to a spread of discrimination attack on Asians and other minority groups based on stereotypes and false narratives regarding the spread of COVID-19. Similarly, discrimination against essential workers spiked even making it difficult to some healthcare workers to find housing for fear that they would bring the virus on with them. As early as February, week before New York City went into lockdown, CCHR has already received 248 complaints of COVID-related discrimination. In April, the New York City Police Department reported a 360% increase in the hate crime in relation to COVID-19, even though the major crime fell nearly 30% in comparison to last year. By the end of June, CCHR would receive 478 COVID-related complaints of these, 167 or 35% of the incident included an element of anti-Asian discrimination or harassment. In the same time, in 2019, the commission re received 22 incidents of anti-Asian discrimination. In response to the uptick and complaints, CCHR formed a COVID response team it also ramped up our which effort and update its online resources and guidance on COVID-related discrimination. This hearing will focus on examining the type of pandemic-related complaints received by CCHR and how they have been handled. The guidance provided by CCHR on COVID-related discrimination 
whether CCHR was adequately able to address the COVID-related discrimination during the pandemic, and finally, whether the city human rights law was uh, sufficiently flexible to respond to the unique discrimination issues that have to face during this pandemic. We also hope to hear from advo advocacy group, organizations, union, and the public on how the virus has impacted New Yorkers and the, the uh, aforementioned target population. I'd like to thank committee staff, Balki Mirig, Senior Counsel of the Committee, William Jury, Policy Analyst, and Nevin Shen, Finance Analyst. And I would like also to thank my staff, uh, Melissa Whitson. Uh, before I turn it over to the administration, I want to acknowledge Council Member uh, Brad. I see Council Member Brad. Thank you so much, Brad. And I, Council Member Parkin, thank you so very much. And uh, I will acknowledge my other colleagues when I will, uh, uh, you know, be informed of the attendance. Now, I would like to uh, call on the administration to testify. But before we do so, I would like to turn it uh, over to the committee council to go over some procedural item and administer the hold. Thank you, Chair Eugene. I'm Balkis Meharry, Council for the Civil and Human Rights Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone you'll be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I'll be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will periodically be announcing who the next panelist will be. The first panelist to give testimony will be representing the administration. I will call on you when it's your turn to speak. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We'll be council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your question. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questions for each panelist outside of the committee chair. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. We will now call representatives of the administration to testify. First, Dana Sussman, Deputy Commissioner, Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs from the Commission on Human Rights, followed by Brittany Saunders, Deputy Commissioner of Strategic Initiatives. Before we begin, I'll administer the oath. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Deputy Commissioner Sussman. Yes. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Saunders. Yes. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Sussman, you may begin. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Eugene and members of the Committee on Civil and Human Rights. Thank you for convening today's hearing on the Commission's COVID-19 response. I'm Dana Sussman, Deputy Commissioner for Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Brittany Saunders, Deputy Commissioner for Strategic Initiatives. The past 10 months have brought unspeakable tragedy, trauma, and hardship. And yet in the face of it all, New York City has shown resilience, strength, and solidarity. The Commission's work and its commitment to protecting and upholding the human rights of all New Yorkers continues unabated. In March 2020, the Commission's entire staff operations moved to remote work over the space of one weekend. The agency's information technology and operations staff moved mountains to ensure that our workflow went on nearly uninterrupted. And despite all of the challenges faced this year, the Commission achieved record-breaking numbers. 
In fiscal year 2020, the commission assessed a record $7.5 million in damages and penalties for violation of the city human rights law. That figure consists of over 6.5 million in damages and nearly 970,000 in civil penalties. This represents a more than six times increase since 2014, the year prior to Commissioner Malalas's tenure and the fifth straight record breaking year. One of Commissioner Malalas's goals for the agency as she has mentioned before this body before was to ensure that cases at the commission are valued the same as cases filed in federal and state court and the agency has achieved that goal. Damages and penalties do not, however, paint the full picture. Assessing high value damages and penalties are not appropriate in all cases, and the commission takes an individualized approach to case resolutions based on the needs of the complainant, the resources and intent of the respondent and other factors. Providing free accessible trainings on compliance with the city human rights law to respondent staff, requiring policy changes locally and in some cases nationally, and requiring a posting, posting of a notice of rights for both staff and customers to see are some low cost but high impact terms of resolutions the commission often deploys to ensure meaningful and long-term change and compliance. With very limited exceptions, every case resolution includes a restorative element. In some cases, the entirety of the resolution is restorative. Deputy Commissioner Brittany Saunders will speak to our restorative justice work in greater detail in her testimony. While assessing a record level of damages and penalties, the commission also closed a new high of 1,066 cases and reduced the average age of open cases by two months, despite all of the challenges faced during the last four months of the fiscal year. The commission's law enforcement bureau filed 525 new cases in fiscal year 2020 and completed 403 successful emergency interventions. The commission settled 264 cases in fiscal year 2020, of which 43 were settled through mediation. The number of mediated cases rose from the prior year. The agency received a slightly increased number of reports of discrimination in fiscal year 2020, from 9,804 in fiscal year 2019 to 10,015 in fiscal year 2020. Consistent with past years, the protected categories of disability, gender, and race were the top three most reported areas of discrimination. Gender discrimination, including discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sexual harassment cases, accounted for the largest share of damages and penalties, over $3 million, a remarkable sum. We just passed the third anniversary of the Me Too movement going viral, and with it, the commission saw a dramatic increase in sexual harassment workplace claims. This over $3 million figure is reflective of many of those cases that came to the agency over the past several years. Relatedly, the Commission's online sexual harassment prevention training has been completed over 500,000 times in all 11 languages since it was launched in April 2019. Beginning in February 2020, New Yorkers began reporting discrimination related to the pandemic. Anti-Asian bias comprised nearly 40% of all COVID-19 related reports. In order to respond quickly to the influx, the Commission created a COVID-19 response team made up of multilingual staff across the agency. From February 2020 through September 2020, the COVID-19 response team fielded 566 reports of discrimination, 184 of which included an element of anti-Asian discrimination. By comparison, the commission received just 26 reports of anti-Asian discrimination during the same time period the year prior. The commission has worked closely with organizations that work with Asian communities across the city including the Chinese American Planning Council, the Asian American Federation, the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, and Homecrest Community Services, among others. In response to the rise in anti-Asian discrimination, the commission organized six bias and hate crime reporting town halls, bringing together district attorney's offices and multiple city agencies to do the important work of explaining the differences between hate crimes and discrimination issues and providing a non-carceral non response to these concerns. These Town halls were provided in English, Mandarin, Korean, Japanese, and Tagalog, including one recently in partnership with NYPD's newly formed Asian Hate Crimes Task Force. The first of these town halls was attended by over 1,200 people. Additionally, the, the commission has held 18 bystander intervention trainings with community partners, including organizations like Hollaback and the Center for Anti-Violence Education. The Commission's Bias Response Team, housed within our Community Relations Bureau, responded to 467 bias incidents in this past fiscal year, 
nearly double that of the prior fiscal year. In addition, the Commission is closely monitoring rising anti-Semitism as it relates to the pandemic and beyond. In February 2020, the Com Commission launched a public awareness campaign to combat religious-based harassment and discrimination in housing, the workplace, and in all public places, and to underscore the city's support for Jewish communities. The campaign responded to a rise in anti-Semitism in New York City, in surrounding communities, and around the country, and affirms the rights of all Jewish New Yorkers to be treated with dignity and respect. It included investments in Jewish community press, both in papers and, in and online. And the campaign also provided information on how to report harassment and discrimination to the commission. Building off of this work, the commission, led by the agency's Jewish Communities Liaison, has fostered relationships with Orthodox Jewish leaders in Crown Heights and Williamsburg, and has become a direct connection to our agency to, to provide resources and support. In recent weeks, as anti-Semitism has again risen to the forefront as a result of COVID-19 fears, we have been in constant contact with community leaders, we have been responding on all of our platforms, and we have been republishing our campaign materials. The Commission's policy team first issued legal enforcement guidance on the intersection of COVID-19 and the city human rights law starting in March 2020. Unlike our federal counterparts at the EEOC or, or the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the Commission has taken the position based on the broad protective language of the city human rights law that actual or perceived COVID-19 and or a history of having COVID-19 is a disability and protected from discrimination. The Commission's guidance covers protections in housing, employment, and public accommodations, is updated frequently to address the rapidly changing needs and concerns of both employers, housing providers, and small businesses, and worker and tenant advocates to protect the safety and health of their workforce, tenants, and customers, while also ensuring people do not face discrimination and harassment in these settings and are, are able to obtain the accommodations they need. The Commission's Community Relations Bureau, or CRB, grew its community outreach numbers in fiscal year 2020, despite most outreach work going virtual in March. The CRB increased the number of New Yorkers served by 20% compared to the prior year, directly connecting with nearly 100,000 people for the first time in a decade. In addition, CRB staff have greatly expanded the Commission's youth engagement, having conducted over 300 youth conferences and launching our Youth for Equity and Solidarity Council in fiscal year 2020 with 23 youth members, who will be working with the Commission over the next year to inform our work and ensure we are effectively reaching young people with the content most critical to them. The Commission has also been working to create resources and actions for young people who do not have their usual outlets for community building and support, and yet are coping with so much right now. For example, just this week, the Commission launched our Amplifying Youth Voices online art exhibit featuring human rights themed visual art, poetry, dance, and song from young people across the city. Earlier this year, we published Stories for All, a human rights focused reading list divided by theme and age group, featuring diverse stories, characters, writers, and experiences, and have created a video, video library of read-alongs for parents and educators. In May, the commission launched a public awareness campaign to combat COVID-19 related discrimination and harassment. The campaign affirms protections for communities facing heightened levels of discrimination and harassment related to the pandemic. In addition, responding to renewed attention to disparities in access, treatment, and outcomes in medical settings, the campaign also addressed New Yorkers' right to be free from discrimination in healthcare settings, regardless of their race, national origin, immigration status, disability, and age. The campaign emphasized that reports to the commission can be made on behalf of others, can be made anonymously, and can be made without fear of being asked about immigration status. The campaign included multilingual advertisements in community and ethnic media, including print and radio, social media platforms, and targeted placements in pharmacies and convenience stores throughout the city. For the first time, the commission leveraged advertising on popular Chinese and Korean social media platforms such as WeChat. Advertising in convenience stores and pharmacies was placed in all five boroughs and concentrated in communities with high proportions of immigrants, communities with limited English proficiency, and communities facing high levels of poverty. These multilingual placements in Chinese, English, Korean, and Spanish focused on the right to be free from discrimination in healthcare settings. Promoted social media posts appeared in over 10 languages, which expanded upon a, a set of anti-stigma videos created by the commission featuring our multilingual staff, which were already available in 12 languages. And next week, the commission will be announcing an art series with one of the commission's two public artists in residence, Amanda Pingbodipakia, entitled, I Still Believe in Our City 
the visually stunning series is a testament to the vibrant resilience of New Yorkers and specifically honors Asian and black New Yorkers in the face of racial injustice, xenophobia and COVID-19 related discrimination, harassment and bias. It will include a takeover of Atlantic Terminal in Brooklyn and will also be found on Link NYC kiosks, bus shelters, a DOT public art site and a community mural. The commission serves on multiple formal and informal interagency task forces as our work involves tenant protection, health, food security, immigrants' rights, racial equity, and beyond. And the agency's information is included in many of these relevant materials housed at other agencies. The commission is also part of many informal and formal national coalitions of human rights agencies. And it is not unusual for our agency, for other agencies to look to us as a model on how to respond to the crises facing our localities. It is with great pride that our staff and our work is recognized as national leaders in the fight for human rights and civil rights. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Deputy Commissioner Brittany Saunders, to highlight the commission's operational changes in light of the COVID-19 pandemic and our focus on confronting anti-Black racism during this critical time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, Chair Eugene and members of the good Committee morning. on Civil and Human Rights. Thank you for welcoming me here today to testify alongside my colleague, Deputy Commissioner for Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs, Dana Sussman, at today's hearing on the Commission's COVID-19 response. My name is Brittany Saunders, and I serve as Deputy Commissioner for Strategic Initiatives at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Deputy Commissioner Sussman's testimony covered how the Commission was able to shift to remote work in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and how, despite the disruptions experienced over the past months, the agency has been able to meet the challenges of the moment. The commission has done so by assessing record setting damages and penalties, launching culturally competent outreach efforts, promulgating guidance on how the city human rights law protects New Yorkers who have or who are perceived to have COVID and putting forward new public education campaigns. My testimony will focus on other aspects of the commission's work during this period with particular attention to the impact on our operations, our work on racial justice issues, and our integration of restorative justice practices across departments. As Deputy Commissioner Sussman noted, like so many other agencies, the commission was required to move to remote work on short notice due to the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, despite our central office and five borough-based community service centers being closed to visitors, we were nonetheless able to resume our work using alternative platforms. We are grateful to the Office of Emergency Management for its support with respect to continuity of operations planning and to the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications for the generous assistance with our hardware and software needs. Thanks to this and other support, within days of our transition, we'd adjusted to inter our internal practices to accommodate remote work and we're using new web conference tools to put forward public facing programs. Of course, as the city agency charged with enforcing and educating New Yorkers about local human rights protections and obligations, our focus during the pandemic has been squarely on the connections between COVID-19 and discrimination. Many of these connections, as Deputy Commissioner Sussman noted, relate to ways in which particular groups of New Yorkers have been targeted for harassment and intimidation because of their perceived exposure to the virus. However, other connections are rooted in long-standing historical disparities. As so many, as, so many have noted, the COVID-19 pandemic has made the devastating impacts of stru structural racism undeniable. Discrimination and other barriers in the housing and job markets have made Black and Latinx New Yorkers particularly vulnerable to the virus's effects. Over the past five years, the Commission has steadily intensified its work on racial justice issues. This is evident in the accomplishments of its Law Enforcement Bureau, which investigates and resolves cases, including cases of discrimination based on race, and color. In fiscal year 20, the commission fielded some 562 inquiries related to race-based discrimination. This represents considerable growth over fiscal year 14 in which there were just 172 inquiries made. Of the complaints that were filed by members of the public last year, 11% related to race, making it the third highest trending category of protection among filed claims. The commission also secured newsworthy settlements in race cases such as a conciliation requiring payment of $70,000 in civil penalties and establishment of a pipeline for stylists of color at a high-end salon, and another requiring luxury brand Prada to create a new scholarship program and establish a high-level diversity and inclusion officer role. 
These continue to receive attention from news media and other civil rights bodies because of their innovativeness and comprehensiveness. More recently, the commission has acted forcefully in response to attempts to deploy law enforcement against black people in the city, an all too common and all too normalized form of discrimination and harassment, becoming the first law enforcement agency to announce an investigation into the Amy Cooper incident in Central Park. These items are worth mentioning alongside those emerging from the agency's COVID-19 response team because they demonstrate the agency's commitment to addressing the consistent and pervasive forms of racism that black New Yorkers and other people of color in the city encounter in the workplace, in housing, and in places and spaces of open to the public. The commission has also used research as a means of achieving an in-depth understanding of how black New Yorkers experience anti-black racism. The agency's commitment to centering these issues stems from our treasured partnerships with organizations serving the city's black communities, our dedication to rooting our work in, which, in, rooting our work in what our partners tell us is most needed from us, and the Commission's own historical roots as a successor to a body that was established in the wake of protest by Black New Yorkers in the 1930s and 40s. Our commitment to listening to and using our voice as a government uh, to elevate the concerns of Black New Yorkers led us to develop over a two-year period Black New Yorkers on their experiences with anti-Black racism, a report that surfaced concerns about widespread systemic racism similar to the concerns voiced by protesters earlier this year. In early 2018, Years before the spring's protests, but inspired by consultation with our partners, the commission launched a qualitative research project on the particular forms of racism encountered by African-American, Afro-Caribbean, African and Afro-Latinx New Yorkers, along with others who identified as having African ancestry. The agency partnered with a black woman researcher to conduct more than a dozen interviews with advocates and community leaders and 19 focus groups with almost 200 black New Yorkers from across the five boroughs. We engaged a pool of Black New Yorkers that reflected the rich diversity of the city's communities with respect to gender, ethnicity, immigration status, sexual orientation, housing security, and other uh, characteristics, um, and other characteristics, and emerged with a devastating, though not surprising, set of findings. The Black New Yorkers who participated in our research described racism as something that was emotionally taxing and inescapable. As one participant relayed, one has to be a tactician to survive. They described experiencing racism in their day-to-day -day interactions and observing its impacts within and across institutions. They recognized racism and disparate treatment by law enforcement, store owners, employers, and healthcare providers. And they observed astutely that consistent racial disparities and outcomes across the criminal, legal, health, and education systems were rooted in racism as well. When we asked participants to tell us where they observed racism having the greatest impact, interactions with law enforcement emerged as a top concern. The report features painful accounts of the impact of racism in law enforcement, from the fear of injury or death that Black New Yorkers feel when stopped by the police, to the trauma of repeatedly witnessing police violence. These learnings, which mirror the demands of racism um, by those, the, which mirror the demands raised by those who marched in the city streets this spring, will inform the commission's work. At the conclusion of the report, the commission, for its part, committed to a series of action steps based on the lessons gleaned from this research which mirror demands of those who march for racial justice reforms this spring. These action steps include developing policy interventions designed to address anti-Black racism, holding hearings on race discrimination and expanding education and outreach efforts related to anti-Black racism. And in the coming months, we will have more to share about work in this area. We also hope that the report will be a resource for public and private institutions that have been grappling with how to respond to calls for racial justice that echoed through our streets this spring. Finally, I'd like to share a bit about the Commission's efforts to integrate restorative justice practices across our areas of work. As an agency, we define restorative justice as an approach to acts of bias and discrimination that centers the experience of the harmed person and involves all stakeholders to decide what should be done to repair harm, create accountability, and reduce the likelihood of future harm. We have consulted with experts on restorative justice in order to determine our approach. With their support, we have put restorative justice practices to work in our policy efforts, for instance, experimenting with hearing structures in order to create spaces that promote healing. We have attempted the same in our community outreach and education work, helping to match community, to group, community groups with support for facilitation. And we have integrated these practices into the way we resolve cases. The commission's source of, unit, source of income unit, for example, uh, negotiated multiple set aside agreements or requirements rather in, connection, in conciliation agreements wherein housing providers reserved a percent of the landlord's units for tenants using housing vouchers. 
This novel strategy is a unique form of restorative justice in source of income discrimination cases, allowing the commission to repair the harm an individual faced while also seeking to address the broader crisis of access to housing for voucher holders. The greatest lesson of the commission's work during this immensely challenging period for our city, however, has been that a tremendous amount of work remains to be done. Encouragingly, there seems to be a deeper commitment than ever across city agencies to take on long-standing disparities in employment, housing, health, and other areas that have made COVID-19 such a destructive force in the city's communities of color. Mm -hmm. And we are eager to honor the agency's legacy in partnering with our colleagues across the administration and council and in communities across the city to address these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Saunders. I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilmember Rosenthal. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Eugene. Deputy Commissioners, please do not mute your microphones if possible during questions. As a reminder, if council members other than the chair would like to ask a question of the administration, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. Again, we'll be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. Uh, Chair Eugene, you may begin. Thank you very much. I want to acknowledge that we have been joined by Council Member Washington. And uh, let me, uh, to begin, thank uh, Deputy Commissioner Sussman and uh, Saunders. Thank you very much. And I want to thank uh, all the, the leaders and the groups and unions, members and association advo advocacy group who are part of this uh, very important hearing. Uh, Commissioner, any one of you can uh, answer. Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner Sussman or uh, Sander, can you provide a breakdown of all type of COVID-related complaints CCHR received this year? And how many complaints of each category or type were uh, presented to you? Sure. I. Um... I'm happy to do that. We, I have, um, and I can share this um, document later on, but we, while we noted that we had over 500 COVID related inquiries um, from February until the end of September, it actually represents um, 901 related claims. So many times people will call and they will say, you know, that it relates to disability and national origin or disability and something else, age, for example. So we would count each of those individually. Um, so that means that the total is, actually surpasses the 500 plus number that I mentioned in my testimony. Um, it, I'm not sure if you would want me to go through every single category because we have many um, in the city human rights law, but I can go through the top ones, um, which include uh, disability, at 118, um, race 126, um, caregiver status 14, citizenship status 10, age 11, lawful occupation 10, gender 13, um, national origin 17, pregnancy 12. Um, so that's just a sampling of the different types of complaints that we've received, or inquiries I should say that we've received related to COVID-19. Thank you so much. When we when we, we are talking about COVID-related complaints, how do you identify, uh, you know, uh, this complaint or that complaint is related to COVID? What is your your, your definition of a COVID-related complaint? So typically, how do you determine that you know which complaints are COVID-related or not? Um, so. It is my understanding, and we can we can oh, we can follow up um, with our law enforcement bureau to get more clarity if if you if you'd like it. But it's my understanding that you know the vast majority of these inquiries explicitly name COVID nineteen as the as the cause. Whether it's um, I had it, I I have it currently. Um, someone in my family has it. I have pre existing conditions that make me vulnerable to it or vulnerable to a more severe um, experience with COVID 19. Um, I am taking care of my children and, man and trying to work because of you know, um, schools going remote or schools being closed um, specific to COVID 19. So typically, the caller will identify 
that this is explicitly COVID-19 related. When we're talking about race and national origin, um, it typically is articulated that someone is be feels as though they are being targeted because of their race as it relates to COVID-19 motivated discrimination or harassment. So we are not, um, we don't have a strict definition. We have, but, but it's really reflective of the experience and the narrative that the caller provides. Could you uh, elaborate a little bit more about the difference that you can make between a regular complaint of discrimination that, that could happen anytime during COVID or, or, or during the normal time? How do you make the different, uh, you know, different between COVID related complaint of discrimination or normal complaint of discrimination that could happen anytime? Sure. So as I mentioned, the caller will typically self-identify their and, and describe their own experience. And so the COVID-19 related um, inquiries are quite unique to the current moment. They explicitly speak to um, their experience related to either the quarantine or lockdown or changes to how to access services um, due to COVID-19, changes to their workplace due to COVID-19, um, specific accommodations they may need related to COVID-19 or other underlying conditions. Um, an example of a kind of matter that might come to us that is not COVID-19 related in this moment might be um, you know, someone who works at a store who's being sexually harassed. That still happens. That's not specific to COVID-19. They're still working. Um, people can be, you know, harassed and discriminated against in the workplace, um, whether it's remote or whether it's in person. Um, and that, again, would be something that, that we continue to see, but is not explicitly COVID related, so would not be captured in the inquiries that I just identified. Thank you very much. You mentioned that, you know, uh, CCHR has created a COVID-19 response team. Can you talk about uh, the team? How many people staff the team? And was the number of people who staff the, te the team was sufficient? Sure. Um, I don't have the number of people who have who are currently on the team right now. But what I what we did do is we pulled staff, uh, multilingual staff from all parts of our office. We have um, uh, staff from our intake, our intake department, our info line staff, we have law enforcement um, staff, and we have community outreach staff. Um, and we, we pulled, you know, from, a di from the resources that we have to respond and focus our response um, and ensure that there was a dedicated team regularly communicating about what they were seeing and how they were responding. Um, and I believe I testified a little bit more specifically to this in a prior hearing around the staff numbers, but I can very easily get that information back to you. In your testimony, you say that and despite all the challenges faced this year, the commission achieved record the broken number. In fiscal year 2020, the commission assessed a record of 7.5 million in damages and penalties for violation of the city human rights law. But what the, you have been doing, what the commission have been doing, you know, to prevent the increase of violation of the civil right, human rights, what the commission has been doing in terms of prevention, education, training for the general public. I'm not talking about the staff, the people who are going through COVID because COVID 19 or this uh, crisis, you know, affected as you know, everybody. People have stress, they will have a PTSD. This is a very critical situation for any human being. So, what you know, the commission has been doing to try to help the people cope with this very difficult situation to prevent the violation of human rights, to let them know, hey guys, you know, this is different difficult situation for all of us, but you still should remember people have rights and you should respect the right of the people. Um, so there's a couple ways that um, we work to prevent violations of the city human rights law. Um, one is that, as you mentioned, there were record uh, damages and penalties assessed in the past fiscal year. As, as I mentioned in my testimony, as part of nearly every um, resolution, we work to ensure wide-ranging change. 
Um, and Deputy Commissioner Saunders also spoke to this with respect to some of our resolutions with restorative justice. Every resolution we require training. Um, we require that we often we provide. We provide free training that is now virtual, available to respondents at no cost. Um, we have mandated policy changes, both locally and nationally in some circumstances. So we are having national impact in some of our cases. Um, we have required monitoring so that employers or housing providers have to report back to us on a, reg on a regular basis for a period of several years regarding internal complaints, policy changes, compliance, hiring practices. That ensures institutional change beyond that period of time that we are investigating. Um, further, when we're talking about outreach and education, part of what we do is educate community members about their rights. We, we also educate covered entities who, are, who have obligations under the city human rights law um, to understand what they need to do, their responsibilities. In addition to that, we work to foster positive intergroup relationships. And we know that in a city as diverse as ours, communities, there are community tensions and they flare up at different moments, particularly in moments of crisis. And we have worked to build relationships across different communities. We have very successfully hosted over two, over two dozen bystander intervention trainings with experts, um, some focused on combating anti-Black racism, some focused on combating anti-Asian discrimination and harassment, some focused on combating anti-Semitism, um, others just focused broadly on intervening when you see something happen and doing it safely, and especially safely right now in what, when we're all taking extra precautions about sort of being close in close proximity to one another. So. We have, we have lots of different tools in our, in our toolbox, so to speak, regarding creating longer term and lasting change. And I also think, while I mentioned that damages and penalties are not the only, uh, the only metric by which we should measure our impact, it sends a message. The commission is a, um, is a credible venue for people to bring claims of violations of their human rights and respondents or potential respondents understand that and know that filing at the commission means that we're going to do a thorough investigation. We are going to assess you know, damages and penalties. We're going to demand real change. And that puts respondents or would be respondents on notice um, in, a preventative, in a preventative posture. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, you know, penalties uh, are very, you know, reinforcements of law. Uh, uh, you know, is very important, but I think education and awareness and outreach is very, very important also. Because many people may be violating the right of people, they, they may not even be aware of that. They may not know if they are violating, you know, the right of other people. I think that we have to make sure we make the effort to educate, to train, to educate the people, the general public, on terms of human rights. Because we, we got to remember that uh, New York City is room to so many people from, coming from everywhere with different culture, with different tradition. So they may not be aware of the, you know, the, the, this very important uh, noble right of other people to be respected, but the right to be respected. We have to make the, you know, the effort to make sure that they understand that they may be violating the right of other people if they do this and do that. I don't say that you don't do it. This is not what I'm saying. But I say this is a very important part of all the effort that you are doing to protect the, the right of the people. And uh, my uh, last question before I turn it to my colleagues. According to CCHR annual report, the COVID-19 response team took nearly 200 action, including of discrimination, and harassment, including providing rapid response support in 38 matters, providing 58 referral to other enforcement agencies uh, and community partners, conducting 18 successful emergency interventions, filing six cases. Can you please elaborate on what rapid response report entail? What can you tell us about, can you elaborate about rapid response support? Sure, 
Sure. And thank you for, yep. Thank you for that question. Apologies. I had muted myself earlier. Um, so I want to make sure that I'm speaking accurately about how we classify our different responses um, on the COVID-19 response unit. Um, early interventions are more oftentimes um, or emergency interventions require some level of advocacy on, on our part, whether that means informing the housing provider or the employer or the provider of public accommodation, what their obligations are, providing them with the guidance that we've, that we've issued, giving them information so that they can um, comply with the law, changing a policy at a building, uh, changing a policy at a store, um, for example. Um, the rapid response may be um, a referral to another agency, or even if um, uh, it may be that another agency is, is more typically suited or better suited to address the situation, we do have a, a lot of our, our InfoLine staff have a ton of information at their disposal to ensure that to, to, to give people um, so that they aren't kind of navigating different, different city agencies. So they may, even if it's not a violation of the city human rights law, they may be able to provide information about an issue, um, whether it's a housing court issue or a concern around an eviction, um, immigration status concern, um, they may be able to provide that information immediately. Um, so that would not count as an early intervention or an emergency intervention because it is not you know, out within our jurisdiction necessarily, but we are still providing that response. Um, we also can, um, uh, we can direct um, an entity in a sort of early intervention to immediately cease the discriminatory act. And if they, if they don't, we can go ahead and file a, um, a, a case against that entity if they don't comply. Um, which is always a tool at our disposal. And that's why some of those cases move from potentially early intervention into a complaint filing posture. Um, but again, I can get a little bit more detail around you know, how we classify rapid response, referral and um, emergency intervention. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, from the 200 uh, uh, action, why were only six cases were filed? Only six cases. Sure. Um, again, for the reason why we established the COVID-19 response unit was because most of these cases required rapid response. And as I've noted on at past hearings, the commission has moved, um, has created this early intervention or pre-complaint intervention process because we recognize that in a lot of situations, especially for specific situations, including requiring disability accommodations, requiring pregnancy accommodations, um, or, um, or issues around, you know, source of income discrimination in housing, that to file a complaint, to wait for an answer, to undertake an investigation would not adequately respond to the individual's immediate needs. And so we've shifted a lot of our resources broadly to pre-complaint interventions, which can be resolved within a matter of a few weeks. Um, or even faster. Um, the COVID-19 response unit was created with that model in mind, that when we're talking about people's health, we're talking about people's ability to stay in housing, when we're talking about people's ability to access the grocery store or deliveries to their apartment related to COVID-19, that we need to respond quickly. So, very, so a, a small proportion of those cases, we are not able to resolve and they may move to a complaint. Um, in addition, a lot of individuals may not want a complaint. They may not want to go through with a full litigation. And so we're looking at, again, trying to, to meet their needs and respond as quickly as we can um, in, that, in, in the, this sort of moment of crisis. Um, and most of those cases are not, um, don't require or a, a complaint to be filed or, is, or it's not what the complainant is or the individual I should say is looking for. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to acknowledge that we have been joined by Councilmember Drum. Thank you, Councilmember. Now I would like to turn it over to the administration in case my colleagues have questions. Thank you, Chair Eugene. I will now call on council members in the order that we use the Zoom raise hand function. If you'd like to ask a question now, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Um, we'll be limiting council member questions to five minutes. Once I call on your name, the sergeant will announce that you can begin and you may begin asking your question. We have a question from council member Lander. 
Time starts now. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Eugene, uh, Deputy Commissioners uh, Saunders and Sussman. It's good to see you here as always, even if not as nice as seeing you in person. Um, and I feel like I'm gonna ask the question I, the, I always ask, which is like first to acknowledge and appreciate all the work the agency is doing, the way it's trying hard with limited resources to grow and expand. Um, uh, I feel like both of your testimonies today were very helpful and your questions in response to the chair and then ask about budget and resources. Um, you know, back in 2015, uh, the administration and the council worked together to substantially add resources to the commission, which had been, you know, disastrously depleted uh, over recent years and watching uh, the mayor who depleted those resources uh, in his uh, current uh, affairs reminds us of how important it is to fight for this commission and how good the work was that you and Commissioner Manalis did to rebuild it. Um, uh, but I also know that, you know, while you rightly spoke about the fact that last year, the wait times, the processing times came down a little, you know, they're still higher than we want them to be. You know, they were at uh, 300 and what uh, I wrote this down somewhere, 340 days back in FY16, and they're up to 515 days. Some of that is because there's so many more cases coming in. Uh, so that's totally understandable. But, you know, we don't want people waiting, you know, the, the better part of two years uh, for their cases to be to be processed. Um, the agency, as I recall, in the budget took a 2% cut, which was less than some other agencies. So uh, less cuts, but certainly more than more than others. Um, and I know that was largely an elimination of lines that had been vacant, but that we had hoped to fill. Um, so I just wonder if you could talk a little about, given all the work that you're doing, all the clarity about how urgent this work is, the value of all the increased work, um, what we need to do uh, to make sure that we're processing those cases in a, in, a, in a successful period in time. And it's valuable to hear from you about the things you've done amidst limited resources to reduce case processing times, because there's no choice but to do that in a time like this. But I think it's also helpful for us to understand what the lack of resources means and just be clear that, you know, if we can provide more resources, then we can bring case processing times down. Um, and if we can't provide more resources, you know, you're going to do what you can, but we're going to leave people waiting for justice longer than we want to. And, you know, if we believe justice delayed is justice denied, then we have to look at that squarely and, and thoughtfully and honestly um, as we're approaching the budget. And, you know, part of the reason why I wanted to see resources moved out of the NYPD and two other agencies is exactly for this purpose. Like this is, you know, the things that D that that um, that the commission is investigating uh, are the kinds of bringing of justice that all of us want more of and, and not less of. So can you just give us a sense of where things stand on your budget, what you're doing in, internally to address it, but also some honest conversation about what you know, the lack of resources means. Sure, I can, I can start. Um, it, it is in fact the case that we, um, in the last cycle, uh, lost some of our vacancies. Um, and, you know, as you said, we are very much accustomed to, to doing as much as we can um, with the resources that we have. And so I think um, as, as much as I think it would have been nice to be able to kind of continue building and fill those vacancies, um, we have, I think, done a, a pretty good job of making um, the best of what we have. And even in some cases, really trying to find, um, you know, uh, outside resources and resources like fellowships or other things to help us um, support some of the work that we're doing. Um, and Dana, I don't know if there's anything that you'd like to add to that. Sure. I, I will also mention that I think, you know, just to be transparent, it has been inc incredibly challenging. I mean, we're facing um, uh, a need that continues to grow. Um, we are, I think, like, to the credit of our communications team and, 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 our, and our leadership, you know, more people know about the commission. Our, our law continues to expand. Um, our laws look to as a model to other jurisdictions. Um, and so we are seeing, we continue to see increases in inquiries. We continue to wanna to do groundbreaking work, um, both on the com complaints coming in from the public and also commission initiated investigations and testing. Um, but 
you know, no one wants to see sort of the gains of the past five, five or almost six years, you know, sort of, um, you know, go backwards or slide backwards. And to, I'm expired. Um, if I may just finish. Um, uh, to, oh, thank you. Um, to um, Councilmember Landers' point around the case processing time, you know, it is higher than it was a few years ago. It did trend down for the first time in a, in a little bit. And that is um, a true testament to our law enforcement bureau, um, which is um, led by uh, Deputy Commissioner Sapna Raj. Um, they worked tirelessly this past fiscal year to um, close out or move to resolution um, much of the older cases, so cases that were filed in 2017. And so our hope is that you will see those numbers continue to improve as we continue to report it out. And as I, tireless, I think is a word that's used a lot, but it really does accurately reflect the work it, um, up, into the, up until the June 30th sort of fiscal year deadline to move those cases. Um, and, and, you know, she personally was overseeing all of those case files and making sure that they, um, that they were um, addressed um, to kind of close up that um, or, or, or improve that processing time. So um, despite the, the challenges, it was a real feat. And, um, and I, we hope that you'll still, you'll see that those numbers will continue to improve. Thank you. Are you, Jim, do you have any further questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Council Member Lender. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, you mentioned that uh, in February 2020, the commission launched a public awareness campaign to combat religious harassment and discrimination in housing, the workplace, and in all public places, and to underscore the city's support for Jewish communities. The campaign responded to a rise in anti-Semitism in New York City, and so are surrounding communities and around the country and affirm the right of all Jewish New Yorkers to be treated with dignity and respect. Before, did you involve or contact the leaders of the Jewish community to be part of this uh, campaign and to communicate with you, to guide you in order to give the better response to this uh, situation? Um, we did. Um, it is our commissioner's uh, guiding principle that we don't sort of engage in any initiative without um, consulting with um, a diverse set of stakeholders. And for that particular campaign, um, we worked with, we have a Jewish, a Jewish communities liaison, a position that our commissioner essentially created um, for, for this very work um, to work with um, Jewish communities across the city, reflecting different denominations, um, different boroughs, um, uh, you know, across the religious spectrum. And the campaign itself, some of the images reflect that diversity. We were, we, it features um, an Orthodox Jewish woman, a Hasidic man, um, a Jewish person of color, um, and uh, and, and, and I'm actually featured in the ad myself. Um, and so, um, you know, we, that was incredibly important and, um, and vital piece of the campaign that we, we wanted to, it served two purposes. One was to lift up and celebrate and honor the diversity of Jewish communities in New York City. Um, and also, um, and to, to provide sort of a, a clear um, beautiful visual of, of New York, Jewish New Yorkers who are proud, who are resilient, who are the, part of the fabric of New York City, and also to ensure that Jewish New Yorkers and others know that we are a resource. We are a place where you can report discrimination and harassment. Of course, we are not the NYPD. Um, we are not able to investigate, you know, on site if there's a, if someone is, you know, physically harmed or in, in, in harm's way or in danger, that, that is not you know, our role. But we want people to know that if they experience anti-Semitic um, hate, discrimination, um, that they know that they can contact us and that we are, um, we are there for them and that we fully support and, um, and stand behind the Jewish community in New York City and, and in surrounding communities. Um, so we did consult with a diversity of Jewish community leaders um, and different um, 
community members. We also consulted within, with experts within our own administration, including the Office to Prevent Hate Crimes, um, the Community Affairs Unit, um, and others to ensure that, um, that the campaign um, struck the right, the right tone and that would be well received within the community. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> we all know that uh, uh, in New York City, many other communities also, Asian community, Black community, Spanish community, people from uh, several uh, ethnicities or group, they have been affected also by discrimination because of COVID. Did you also reach out to the leaders of different communities to make sure they are part of what you know, the commission is doing? To better able to respond, and you know, uh, to this uh, critical, critical situation, because you know that, as I mentioned before, New York City is home to so many people coming from everywhere with the tradition, with the mentality, their belief. So I think that uh, the commission should have created a task force or think tank community, bring the leaders from different communities together, and try to figure out together with the commission and probably also the elected officials, the council members, and see how we can handle and overcome this very, very critical situation, discrimination, harassment, in time of COVID-19. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can say a little bit to get us started there. You know, as Dana mentioned, um, it is really our commissioner's um, commitment and our entire agency's commitment to always be consulting with the communities that are impacted by the problems that we're working on. Um, it's, it's so integrated actually into our regular practice that it's not the sort of thing I think we would necessarily um, have to create a, a formal task force or working group on because it's just a part of our ethos. So for example, um, you know, Dana talked about how we consulted with various leaders and members in the city's Jewish communities in order to pull together the campaign on anti-Semitism. Um, we took a very similar approach um, in terms of developing our work uh, around anti-Asian discrimination uh, related to COVID. And we've worked with groups like the Chinese American Planning Council, um, the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, uh, Asian American Federation, Home Crest Community Services, and others um, in order to, to inform our approach. And then of course, we've also partnered with our um, partners in government um, to pull together some of the town halls that, that Dana mentioned in her testimony. So we did six interagency town halls. We were um, very uh, intentional about making sure that we provided that information in languages that would be, um, that would be um, welcoming and informative for the various communities in question. So we provided programming in Mandarin and Korean, Japanese, Tagalog, um, we also did 18 bystander intervention workshops um, with our partners. And as Dana mentioned, some of those were focused on um, anti-Asian harassment, but we also did uh, a number that were focused on anti-Black violence and anti-Black um, uh, harassment and discrimination as well. And in that area of work, we also um, are you know, very thoughtful about maintaining our connections with, consulting with, um, our you know, partners who work in the city's black communities, whether they are NAACP chapters, whether they are groups that focus specifically on police reform or gender issues or other issues. Um, it's, it's very much part of our ethos and part of our practice um, that we are constantly bringing together community leaders, consulting with them formally and informally in order to make sure that we, um, that we our approach is a, is a wise one. And if I can just add a, um, a little bit, we um, to to Deputy Commissioner Saunders' comments. We also um, host weekly calls with faith and community leaders um, to share updates and inform them of their work. Um, we've had uh, many of our sister agencies join those calls for as guest speakers for updates. Um, we host um, video meetings weekly or reoccurring, I should say, it might not be weekly in the current moment, but it, it was with API community leaders um, serving as a, as a feedback loop to the city. Again, featuring many off many times um, our sister agencies as guest speakers. Um, and we have been part of the larger um, emergency response task force coordinated by OEM um, so that we are based on all of the work that we are doing and the sort of on the ground relationships that we have we're communicating that up to the leadership of other city agencies um, as part of the COVID-19 response. So we have these sort of more formal weekly check-ins with different leaders. We also, as, 
as Deputy Commissioner Saunders mentions, we sort of it's part of our workflow. We are always in communication with with um, community leaders, hearing what they need, fielding criticism, you know, responding in kind. So. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, we all know that when there are different group of people meeting together, having a dialogue, discussing about any topic, there is vibrancy. You know, we enrich each other, especially when they come from different uh, ethnicity. This is a wonderful thing, a positive, a constructive you know, environment. From the experience that you have had meeting with the leaders from different communities, different ethnicity. Could you share with, with us the lesson learned, what you have learned, what was the experience, what you know you believe that should be changed in order to address the issues of discrimination, harassment, facing for different groups. Is there anything that you have been doing you would do differently because of the enrichment, because of the lesson learned from the you know interaction? communicating with sort of different groups? I mean, I can start. I'll say that, um, you know, from, you know, a lot of the consultation that I've been involved in or heard about, you know, I get the sense, and again, this is, some of this is through, you know, meetings or, or um, round tables that we'll pull together, but it's also worth mentioning that our Community Relations Bureau also has lead advisors and liaisons who work with specific communities um, across the city, whether those are religious or ethnic communities, or whether we're talking about the LGBTQ community, um, it's really a, a kind of another institutionalized way for us to keep those lines of communication open. Um, what I'll say thinking about, you know, all the various types of feedback that we get, um, from my perspective, I think a lot of people are deeply appreciative of the work that the commission does. They really, um, you know, are, you know, acknowledge that the fact that we are more visible um, than we have been in recent decades and that um, we are, um, you know, committed to the relationships that we have with them. I think that there's always, particularly under the most recent circumstances, like a desire to see us be able to do, you know, more. So um, more outreach and education, um, more, you know, policy work. Um, so I think it's a mix of both. It is a appreciation for the work we do, but also a desire to see the agency be able to, to take on even more. But Dana, I don't know if there's more you'd want to add. Um, the only thing I would add is, is that our staff, um, we, we have built over the past five and a half years, a staff that reflects the diversity of New York City. I know we've mentioned this before and for our, you know, our, it, across all aspects of the agency. But I think to have staff that speak 30 plus languages that come from the different communities that are impacted by different issues that, um, have, have experienced those same, um, have experienced discrimination, harassment themselves and have, you know, it is, I think, so incredibly meaningful to have representation in government that looks like, sounds like, and has experiences like so many different New Yorkers. And that, I think, is something that um, we, we want to remind everyone of and, and, and just the, the, the incredible dedication of our staff, who, despite all of the challenges that many of them have personally faced over the past seven or eight months in their families, um, in their communities, that they are still showing up every day because they care about this city, they care about the communities that they serve and they want to be present and they want to hear what the communities need. Thank you very much. Uh, we have been joined by uh, Council Member Baron. In earlier, we have been joined by Council Member Drum. I don't know if uh, any of my colleagues has question, the Council. I want to turn it to the committee council now to find out if my colleagues have questions. Thank you. I don't see any um, raise hand functions. So with that, I think we can turn to public testimony. Um, if any council members have questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Sorry. Can, I, can I ask some uh, few more questions to the administration? Can I continue with my few more questions to the administration? Yes. We got time for that? Yes, of course. Thank you much. Uh, commissioners, uh, CCHR recently classified in its uh, guidance that COVID-19 is to be treated as disability. Are there any 
recent development, legal or otherwise, regarding that interpretation as COVID-19 as a disability? Um, no, the, we have, um, again, we are following the uh, medical information as best as we can. Um, and we know that there are so many things yet unknown about the coronavirus, about COVID-19 and how it impacts bodily functions, both in the short term and in the long term. Um, but given the broad definition of disability under the city human rights law, we felt that it was very clearly a disability um, under the city human rights law. And we wanted to be as clear and transparent about that position as possible. Um, we've had a series of conversations with lawyers who represent employers, lawyers who represent workers, and um, we have heard sort of universal feedback that that position makes sense. Um, and also, you know, it is obviously well within the definition of disability under the city human rights law. Um, and so um, that position has not changed. There have been no further developments on that specific position, but we do, um, uh, add, it, it adds very clear, um, it provides the kind of clarity that, that what we've seen from the EEOC sort of lacks. Um, the EEOC has not, as far as I'm aware as of today, has not taken a clear position on this. And so, you know, again, the federal law is a floor um, and the city human rights law is, is instructed to be more protective than state and federal protections. And so we have consistently held to that position. Um, other aspects of the guidance on COVID-19 and human rights have evolved, have, we have expanded upon them as the situations change um, with respect to reopening, other concerns being raised by employers around how to navigate uh, different issues, but that position remains unchanged. According to the mayor or management report, the number of complaints received by CCHR has increased in fiscal year 2020, but the number of complaints has dropped significantly by 34%. Can you explain us why the drop? Sure. So it's my understanding that there's two issues at play here. One is, as I mentioned before, we have moved significantly to pre-complaint intervention where those where it is appropriate. So that means that we are still doing invest, we are still fielding those calls, we are doing investigations, we are doing advocacy, and we are getting cases resolved without ever having to file a complaint. And if we get immediate um, compliance, there is no need in many circumstances to file a complaint. Um, and we think that that is a really effective use of our resources. Um, so you'll see that at over 400 of our matters were resolved through pre-complaint intervention, which is just slightly lower than the year prior, but represents you know nearly half of the kinds of um, uh, inquiries that we, re we receive can be resolved through pre-complaint intervention. Um, the, the other issue though that I will acknowledge is that we saw a real dip in cases filed in March, April, and May um, of, so the last few months of the fiscal year. And that I think is a few factors. One is everyone was sort of scrambling to figure out what life was going to look like. Um, and people's priorities likely shifted away from an administrative process with us for the moment and moved to taking care of their families, figuring out what their employment situation was going to look like, um, you know, caring for their own health and their own safety. Um, so we did see a significant drop in complaints filed in the early months of the pandemic. I can report though that um, over the past few months, I think starting in June, those numbers have again ticked up. So June, July, August, and September numbers um, are looking like uh, for, for cases filed in those months, complaints filed in those months are looking similar to case, the numbers of cases filed pre-pandemic. So we are ticking back up and kind of um, equalizing um, after the, the, that extreme dip in March, April, and May. Um, we also have an extension of the statute of limitations for filing based on the governor's executive order. So if people were unable to commit to the process earlier on because of emergency situations, they can still, you know, the, the, the time on their claims has not expired and they can still file with us and we will continue to follow up with those individuals um, if they, you know, started the process and then, and then didn't complete it. Um, so, so again, uh, on the one hand, we have strategically moved to a place of filing, um, you know, proportion of our cases, um, 
you know, uh, addressing a proportion of our cases through pre-complaint intervention. And we also saw the impacts of the pandemic on our city and on people's capacity to, to engage in the process with us and our own capacity in those very early days to get all of our technology up and running and ready to go to continue to file complaints. But uh, another thing I think also, uh, there have been a decrease also in uh, pre-complaint resolution. How do you explain that? So there is a slight decrease in pre-complaint resolutions. Um, again, one of the, if there were one large proportion of our pre-complaint interventions includes disability accommodations in housing, excuse me. Um, and um, some of that requires on-site inspection of housing accommodations. Um, and that was not something that we were able to do on site in people's homes um, during, the, during those early months of the pandemic. Um, so some of those resolutions were, were, were delayed or continue to be ongoing. Um, but if you look at um, our pre-complaint interventions, I think last year was a record high, a significant, you know, hundreds more than any prior year, if I remember correctly. And the dip in 2020, I think reflects again, some of the challenges we faced in being able to be out and on site for some of those accommodations related pre-complaint interventions um, and some of the delays in people engaging with us in the process early on in the pandemic. But I think um, the numbers will reflect now that we've stabilized. Um, and I will note too, that our law enforcement bureau, our staff, we, our offices did not close for a single day. As we moved to remote work, um, we did it over a weekend. Um, our staff worked heroically to move our, you know, 130 plus person staff from five different offices to remote work over a weekend. And we were up and running on that Monday morning in March, continuing to process things virtually. Of course, there were bumps and hurdles and people needed technology delivered to them. People needed fi physical files delivered to them. Um, but it was um, a huge, a huge um, undertaking and we continue to operate fully, you know, more or less fully remotely um, while also, as I mentioned, filing nearly the same number of complaints per month that we were, that we were filing in January and February. Thank you very much. Uh... CCHR lauded its ability to close more cases this year. However, it appeared that many of these cases were closed despite founding of probable causes. 23% of cases with a probable uh, cause determination were closed in fiscal year 2020, whereas only five and 7% of cases were closed in fiscal year 18 and 2019, respectively. Similarly, 51% of cases were closed for administrative cause. Can you explain why, why there was a, such a significant jump in cases we found in of probable cause being closed this year compared to the prior year? Um, as I mentioned during um, uh, Councilmember Lander's questioning, um, it was a very intentional effort on the part of our law enforcement bureau to review and move um, cases filed prior in 2017 and, and years prior. So any cases that had been at the agency for more than a couple of years, we did a full accounting in an effort to again, you know, reduce case processing times, address cases in a timely manner. And so as a result of that effort, um, many of the cases were, had a few more steps that needed to be taken before moving it to probable cause. And so maybe that was one or two more final interviews, uh, reviewing additional documents, drafting materials internally for review, um, and, or, or attempting to resolve the case you know, before a probable cause was issued, one more attempt to conciliate the matter. Um, so the, that was a concerted effort on the part of our law enforcement bureau and the numbers of probable cause determinations reflect um, that effort to resolve um, as many cases that were filed in 2017 and earlier as possible. 
You know, COVID-19 is, uh, in reality, a health crisis that has caused so many difficulties and has changed also our way of life. So uh, in terms of medical services, uh, is, did you receive uh, some cases, some complaints regarding the service, uh, the health service delivery, uh, people who have been facing difficulties or that, that we may classify as discrimination in terms of receiving medical services because of COVID or, or during the time of COVID? Can you talk about that? I don't have that information at my fingertips, but that's something that we can certainly get back to you on um, as far as numbers of inquiries and or complaints regarding discrimination in the provision of healthcare. care. Um, we do know, however, that um, structural and interpersonal racism exists in healthcare. care. Um, we do know that um, there were very serious concerns earlier on in the pandemic around um, when uh, there were concerns around adequate equipment and personnel to, um, to treat all of the um, ill New Yorkers who were, who were in hospitals, that there might be a, a divvying up of resources and who would be treated um, with more urgency than others. Um, and we were part of many of those conversations with partner agencies about addressing those concerns. Um, so I, it, is, it is an area that we are very much um, looking at. We are in, um, in touch with lots of agency partners around this issue and um, are committed to. And so I, and that was part of our, our outreach campaign included a component of um, if you've experienced racism or discrimination of any kind in a healthcare setting, we wanna know about it. Um, and so I can get back to you to see if, the, if, that, um, if we've had some inquiries around that. I think those are particularly challenging cases for people to bring to us, mostly because they are also, if they're experiencing that, they're also probably experiencing a medical emergency or a fam, a, you know, an, an, an urgent matter with respect to their health or their, their, the health of their loved ones. So navigating, you know, another bureaucracy like ours, you know, which we fully admit we are, we are, an, you know, an administrative agency um, is, is often not a high priority. And so that's one of the reasons why we're looking at this as a more systemic problem. Um, part of that work involves um, what C Deputy Commissioner Saunders spoke to around our, black, our, new, our report on Black New Yorkers' experience with racism. Um, and part of it involves um, you know, soliciting more input from the public to determine what our next um, policy positions and other enforcement positions may be. Uh, and uh, if you'd like, Brittany, if you'd like to add anything, please. Yes, thank you very much. I'm sorry, Commissioner. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I think that was great. I don't have anything to add. Very good. So we all know that, you know, our patients have rights, workers have, have rights also. Whether it doesn't matter if they are medical uh, staff, medical workers, first responders, they all also have rights. And this is their right to receive uh, PPE, adequate PPE, and uh, the, the proper environment to continue to do what they love doing, to provide the good services they have been providing for many years. But uh, we know that you know there have been several difficulties, several issues in terms of uh, those first responders and uh, medical staff and those who put their life in danger on life for us to receive the proper equipment and also the proper environment to save life. But uh, uh, did the commission make any effort to try to understand the situation, to understand the situation? What was exactly the, the essence and the reality? Did the commission try to reach out and to investigate and try to understand what happened in order to prevent or to, to be better able to address eventual situation like COVID-19? Um, I'm not entirely sure if I understand your question. Um, are you asking about our um, efforts to address adequate PPE in hospitals or? Um... Not only PPE, but what I'm saying is that, you know, providing, let's say for example, medical staff, they're putting their life in danger for all of us. They have to be provided in you know, PPE and a proper environment, you know? That was a very stressful situation for all of the first responders, all of the medical professionals. I'm not trying to blame no one, but what I'm saying, I'm saying that, you know, that was a very difficult, painful situation for our first responders. 
for those who put their life in danger to save others, to protect us. So did the commission do, do any effort to try to understand exactly what was going on? Um, we what... Sure, mm -hmm. um, you know, as I mentioned, we're, we're part of many interagency task forces, including ones that are organized by OEM that include Department of Health and, and other experts. So we were aware of what was happening, um, but certainly if, and, and if the distribution of PPE or um, any other sort of um, needs that the pandemic created are, were distributed unequally um, that based on one's protected status, that is something that we would absolutely want to know. Um, we are incredibly grateful and to the work of, of our first responders. Um, our city is, we owe, we owe them a debt of gratitude that I'm not sure we'll ever be able to repay for all of the incredible work that they have done and their commitment to the city and the people of the city in the face of you know, unspeakable tragedy and, and danger. Um, and so if, if there is um, concern that you know, PPE was not allocated equitably based on, again, the protected statuses enumerated in the city human rights law, then we certainly want to know about it. But with respect to the larger issue and the crisis that our city faced in March and April around protecting our first responders, um, we are part of some of the coordinated emergency response um, teams that were, you know, continually updated by City Hall and the administration on on the efforts that, that the city was was taking to address those concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you to both of you for what you have been doing. Thank you for the work uh, that you have been providing to the city of New York and protecting the right of people. I know that is not easy. It's very difficult. And I always say that we are all part of the team. We have to work together because people are entitled to be uh, to uh, uh, to be protected. You know, the rights should be protected. They, they have to be treated with respect and fairness. And uh, again, I thank you for everything that you have been doing. And we will continue to work together to make sure that New York City is a place where everyone can be respected and live with dignity and respect. So now I want to turn it over to the community council. And I'm following your guidance. Should we continue or should you yes. call the... Um, we have some members of the public that want to testify. So unless you have any other questions, we can move on to hear their testimony. No, that's okay. Yes, I will uh, be more than happy to hear them. And again, uh, Deputy Commissioner Susman and uh, Sonda, thank you so very much for your thank work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take thank care. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now turn to public testimony. I'd like to everyone that unlike our typical council hearings we'll be calling we'll be calling individuals one by one to testify each panelist will be given three minutes to speak please begin once the sergeant has started the timer i would now like to welcome um yafa diaz followed by allison lynch and ravi reddy um, Yafa, you may begin your testimony when the sergeant calls time. If council members have questions for um, members of the public, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Um, Yafa, you may begin after the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Yafa? Yafa then? I believe she's on mute. So we'll move on to the next um, witness. Um, you may begin when the sergeant. Oh, sorry. It looks like Yafa's back. Okay. Sorry about that. Was not ready. <laughs> How are you today? Well, Can you good. How are you? First time. Yes. Hi, my name is Yafa. I'm from the <coughs> American Association of New York. I am the lead organizer there. 
and many people before me at this meeting, which I'm very glad council members who touched up on what has been currently going on. Um, what's been challenging for us this year and for the Asian American community is that um, we at AAANY have an incredible amount of sympathy for our East Asian brothers and sisters, and we stand in solidarity with them. We know that anti-Asian uh, hate crimes have risen, and so has anti-Arab uh, hate crimes have risen this past year. Um, I am here, though, to specifically address the rise in racism in the Arab American community, um, in which in this past year we've experienced a lot of harassments and attacks within the Bay Ridge community itself. Um, and we, you know, we don't expect, we cannot expect the city of New York to eliminate racism in the five boroughs, but we can demand that when a member of any community is targeted because of their faith or the color of their skin, that the city helps them seek justice for too many Arab Americans. So for this year, this has not been the case and too often uh, cut and dry hate crimes are treated as routine criminal cases by the NYPD, uh, denying victims the justice they deserve. Repeatedly, they have refused to open bias investigations into cases where clear biases exist. And so today we're here to bring attention to this and we ask that we pay more close attention to these hate crimes towards anti-Asian Americans and anti-Arabs. And um, we hope to further our work with our city council members in the future. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Do you have any questions or should we move on to the next person? Uh, Yefa, thank you so very much for uh, your testimony. Thank you for sharing with us your experience. But uh, plus, you know, are these uh, type of discrimination or, or situation affect your daily life? Well, daily life wise, as the lead organizer, I have to organize any type of um, any type of like reaction towards this. We have people who come into our office to make complaints. And so we take those complaints seriously. And then we, we then give it to the um, hate crimes office at the mayor's office. Um, a lot of it gets written down, but uh, what we want is more trainings. We do like de-escalation trainings. Uh, one of the speakers had mentioned before, and we'd like more resources for this specifically so that we can host these either virtual trainings, uh, know your rights trainings, and then also uh, provide uh, language assistance for our community, people who don't understand how, uh, how to actually react or go about seeking justice when incidents like this happen to them. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. You mentioned a very, <clears throat> a very important key word, training, and I would add, add also education. Yes. Because I, I think that uh, as a city, as a society, we have to continue to train each other, to educate each other, and to make everybody understand that we are all members of the same society, the same city. There's one city. And it is our responsibility to make sure that everyone is treated with fairness and respect and dignity. And we can, when we can achieve that, the city is going to be a better place for all. Thank you so much for what you Thank have been you doing. Thank you so much. Take Thank care. You. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. The next panelist will be Allison Lynch, followed by Ravi Reddy, followed by Scott Richmond. Uh, Richmond, sorry. Um, Allison, you may begin after the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, Good morning, my name is Allison Lynch and I'm a staff attorney in Disability Rights New York's Protection and Advocacy for Individuals with Mental Illness Program. DRNY is the federally designated independent agency serving as New York State's protection and advocacy system for people with disabilities. We've worked alongside the commission on a variety of issues and appreciate their recognition of how disability related discrimination can affect the lives of so many. We encourage the commission to work proactively on behalf of individuals with disabilities who are now more than ever at a greater risk of discrimination and harassment due to their disability status. As is the case with many other aspects of emergency preparedness when it comes to this pandemic, people with disabilities are often the last to be asked and the first to be impacted. 
This can also lead to unchecked discrimination against our most vulnerable residents. And DRNY has worked to ensure that we can adequately provide support during this time to those who may otherwise have been overlooked, either through direct support or by providing referral agent to partner agencies like the commission. The commission has recognized that the category of dis disability discrimination is one of its most frequently cited in complaints, and this has only increased with the pandemic. This was particularly true for individuals experiencing homelessness and individuals with mental illness. It's well documented that individuals with disabilities have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. That doesn't just mean that they're at higher risk of having complications. It means in reality that they're at higher risk of contracting it, not being able to properly quarantine, and not receiving the same standard of care once they do contract it. Often this is due to their living situation. These types of situations can compound discrimination and necessitate a greater all hands response to combat disability related discrimination. The commission has been an ally, but there are several issues that led to discrimination that have not been as widely discussed and we believe it's important to bring them to light. The first involves individuals who live in congregate settings. These can include nursing homes, adult homes, group homes, and particularly homeless shelters. Homeless New Yorkers are statistically far more likely to have a disabling condition. And when the pandemic hit, these New Yorkers were forced to quarantine in shelters without PPE for residents or staff, without room to social distance and without access to testing. And additionally, many reported a lack of information about what was happening at a time when this education was so important to our rapidly under evolving understanding of this disease. The move to house individuals in hotels came weeks after many shelters, it, many individuals in shelters were already sick or exposed. And while the program had good intentions, there remained issues with appropriate discharge and timely care. The confusion and ongoing conflict surrounding these hotel placements and shelters in general led to an increase in calls to DRNY about discrimination. And many callers felt they were not sure. You, you Can can I briefly outline just some recommendations that I have for the commission and, and finish up my remarks. Yes. yes. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, DRNY recommends as many others have today that preparation for multiple waves of the pandemic is paramount. It's our position in making these preparations and reviewing what happened in the early stages that individuals with disabilities who are most at risk should be prioritized in any planning, guidances and recommendations that could impact their care, both in congregate settings and in the community. Preparation should include outreach, education, and proactive engagement with members of disenfranchised groups, as well as those in close contact, either to ensure that they understand potential rights violations, and also to ensure that friends, family, and advocates have a clear understanding of how to engage with the commission on behalf of or alongside of individuals with disabilities who may be unaware of the protections that they have the rights to. We believe that it is incredibly important for everyone to be not just aware, but for there to be an increased outreach effort to these more marginalized populations, as was shown with it, these increased calls that we received to our intake lines during the initial response to COVID. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, Ms. Lynch, for your testimony. I want to commend you and thank you also for raising your voice, for standing for a very important group of our community, of our society, the people with disability. When there is any type of issues, they are more, they are uh, affected, they're suffering from any uh, issues, any problem of our society. I think it is a moral responsibility also as a society to make sure that they can be treated fairly and they can benefit all the resources that our society can offer. This is very important, and I think that uh, uh, we have to always, always make the effort as we address the issues of all communities, all type of, 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 of people in our society. We have to make sure that we bring uh, the issues on the table as priorities also. It is our moral obligation. When we can do that, our society is going to be a better place. Thank you so very much. But in addition to what you have said, is there any recommendation that you can give to our city council members in terms of you know, getting together, in terms of making the effort, effort to better address the issues affecting the people with disability? 
Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to talk a little bit about that one, one recommendation. And, and, and excuse me, and excuse me. Sure. if you don't have all the information, you can gather them, please, and send them, send the information to us and we council members, especially in the Committee on Civil and Human Rights, we will go Absolutely. over it and get back to you and see what else we can do in addition to what we are doing now. I would greatly appreciate the opportunity to submit not just written testimony, but be able to sit down and address some of these issues one-on-one -on -one with anyone who's interested. So please uh, please feel free to contact me offline and, and we can go through all of this. Very briefly, I will say that the recommendations that we do have in addition to a robust and proactive outreach strategy is looking at many of the systems that are interconnected that impact people with disabilities. So for example, many individuals with mental illness who were prematurely discharged from hospitals when they needed to reallocate or repurpose bed space were then kind of left in the lurch in terms of community psychiatric care because those facilities were closed due to the pandemic. So a lot of those individuals then ended up feeding into the shelter system that was already overrun with individuals who were having difficulty quarantining, receiving routine medical care to begin with. So this kind of domino effect that we saw from system to system was, was made more difficult by the fact that there were not, in, in our minds, enough people kind of on the ground directing traffic, if you will. There, there was not the attention paid to each system individually and how it can impact the next system that individual will be shuffled off to. So, you know, the, the crisis that we're seeing in the shelter system right now for, for individuals with disabilities and mental illness facing so much discrimination about their current location, the, the plan in place right now is only going to shift them to another neighborhood and another facility where these same issues may come up. And so what what we urge and, and really encourage individuals here today to, to think about and to look at is a way to uh, bring in many different members of the community who will be impacted by these individuals moving through the system and look at a more cohesive strategy of ensuring that they have the support from you know point A to point B, even despite continued closures and uh, continued challenges in, in light of the COVID pandemic. Thank you very much, Ms. Lynch. Thank you so very much and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you for your time today, you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'd like to call on Ravi Reddy, followed by Scott Richmond, followed by Hallie Lee. We'll begin with Ravi and you may begin your testimony after the start of the time. Time starts now. So I want to thank the committee chair for holding this hearing and giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm Robbie Reddy. I'm the associate director for advocacy and policy at the Asian American Federation. AAF represents a collective voice of more than 70 member nonprofits serving 1.3 million Asian New Yorkers. But here's what our community is dealing with. A 35% increase in debts compared to the five-year average. Our small businesses are dealing with being hit earlier and harder because of the early waves of pre-pandemic anti-Asian xenophobia. And our elders continue to avoid going out despite needing food or getting medication for fear of getting attacked. Cases like that of an 89-year-old Asian elder who was literally set on fire in Brooklyn in late July are emboldening racists and stoking fear across our community. And the Trump administration's continued use of anti-Asian rhetoric in discussing COVID-19 alongside a continued public charge assault have exacerbated our community's awareness of engaging fully with our rights and with the services we are entitled to. So this much should be clear. For many of our 1.3 million Asian New Yorkers, two and three of whom are foreign born, human rights are not something we take for granted. We are deeply grateful that the City Commission on Human Rights and this committee have taken a proactive role in acknowledging the challenges facing our community. As Deputy Commissioner Sussman cited, our advocacy efforts have contributed to the city response in multiple ways, such as the city coordinating resources to respond to hate crimes, creating a reporting tool in seven Asian languages, and creating safety resources to keep our community members safe. But we're here because we need to work harder together. In the first half of the year, CCHR collected more than 100 bias incident reports against Asian Americans just between February and May, 
we received 371 such complaints through, its, uh, through our own reporting portal in the first half of this year. And underreporting is a serious issue as 70% of Asian New Yorkers are immigrants and systemic factors like high poverty, high LEP rates, and lack of immigration status deter reporting. Clearly reporting systems require much improvement. Systems that are meant to serve our most vulnerable should keep them top of mind. Like the very real possibility that say a senior LEP Asian immigrant already isolated due to pandemic restrictions and without a smartphone or access to stable internet might be attacked and need immediate access to accessible reporting facilities and safety resources. So this work requires a proactive outreach and educate education approach within our community about the resources at our disposal, such as how the Commission on Human Rights can support those who are victims of bias incidents. Here, so here are some of our recommendations. One, as a trusted leadership organization in the community, funding of, for our efforts will help us continue coordination of response measures, such as encouraging reporting and developing community safety and security resources outside of law enforcement and spearheading awareness campaigns in solidarity with Black and Latino communities. But we and our partners are currently doing the work with minimal funding, far less than is necessary, to bring our work to scale concerning the size of our community. That needs to change. Second, we need to make sure every New Yorker has access to reporting systems and resources, regardless of the language they speak. I'm expired. Um, might, might I just wrap up? Yes, you may. So regardless so, of the language they speak, and this, this includes increased funding for the hiring of language speakers who reflect our most vulnerable communities and increasing translation capacity for community resources. And finally, to that end, we absolutely need more data on the nature of bias incidents being reported and how they're being resolved, especially given the lack of clarity regarding resolution of verbal assault cases. So on behalf of AAF, I wanna thank you for letting us speak with you about the state of human rights in our community. This is an important and personal topic of discussion for our community members. And we look forward to working for continuing our work with CCHR, this committee and council members to make sure we can provide the robust defense for New Yorkers human rights that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rady. Thank you. And uh, I, I, I'm going to talk to the community council to contact you because we would like to have uh, your recommendation and probably, you know, uh, continue the conversation uh, with you before the orga your organization. Because Absolutely. as I said all the time, we are all part of the team. And it will take the effort of all of us from different ethnicity, from different uh, socioeconomical situation to work together to make New York City better. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. And just as a reminder, written testimony can be submitted to the council's email at um, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Um, next, I'd like to welcome Scott Richmond um, to speak. You may begin your testimony after the sergeant has called time. Time starts now. Good morning, Chairman Eugene and the members of the Committee on Civil and Human Rights. My name is Scott Richmond. I am honored to be the Regional Director for ADL's New York and New Jersey Regional Office. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify here today regarding the Commission on Human uh, Rights response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, while my remarks will focus on the rising tide of identity-based hate and harassment stemming from the COVID-19 pandemic, I hope that the Commission will also give priority attention to the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 has had on communities of color in New York City, due in large part to the systemic inequities uh, and structural racism in housing, on, uh, employment, education, policing, and health care. Uh, just uh, by way of introduction, since 1913, the mission of ADL has been to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment for all. Over the past three decades, ADL has been recognized as a leading resource on effective responses to violent bigotry, conducting an annual audit of anti-Semitic incidents, and drafting model hate crimes statutes for state legislatures. In our experience, hate crimes and bias incidents demand priority attention because of their, social their special impact. These acts are intended to intimidate not only the victim, but also members of the victim's entire community, leaving them feeling fearful, isolated, and vulnerable. By making members of targeted communities fearful, angry, and suspicious of other groups and of the power structure that is supposed to protect them, these incidents can damage the fabric of our society and fragment communities. Amid the ongoing threat of the COVID-19 pandemic, there are surging reports of xenophobic and racist incidents targeting members of the Asian American and Pacific Islander and Jewish communities. 
Asian Americans have been told to go back to China, having been blamed for bringing the virus to the United States and have been referred with racial, to with racial slurs, spat on and physically assaulted. At the same time, members of the Orthodox Jewish community have also been blamed for the spread of the virus. Here in New York and New Jersey, posts on social media have suggested that Orthodox and Haredi Jews should be denied medical treatment if they get sick, called on law enforcement to use water hoses and tear gas to stop Haredi and Orthodox communities from gathering, and even indicated that the Orthodox Jewish community should be wiped off the planet once and for all. Extremists have also continued to spread anti-Semitic and xenophobic conspiracies about COVID-19, blaming Jews and China for creating, spreading, and profiting off the virus. Indeed, according to a new study by ADL's Center for Technology and Society, during the hours immediately following the president's initial tweet about his and the first lady's COVID-19 diagnosis, there was an 85% increase in anti-Asian sentiment and conspiracy theories on Twitter, and a 41% increase in the rate of discussions about conspiracy theories generally, with many I'm of those expired. taking on anti-Semitic overtones. I just have a little bit more. Can I uh, conclude? Yes. Thank you. The truth is that framing the pandemic as a foreign problem violates international guidelines because it can lead people to unfairly stigmatize groups based solely on their protected characteristics. And despite narratives to the contrary, the vast majority of Haredi and Orthodox communities are adhering to public health directives and distancing regulations. While there certainly have been some instances of non-compliance and these incidents are extremely disturbing, these aberrations are not unique to the Haredi or Orthodox communities. Nevertheless, as too often is the case, the bad acts of a few have been widely attributed to an entire community, leading many to conclude that the Orthodox community as a whole is collectively failing to adhere to public health directives and is therefore responsible for recklessly or even intentionally attempting to spread COVID-19, an untrue and alarming allegation reminiscent of age-old anti-Semitic tropes blaming Jews for spreading filth and plague. ADL is deeply concerned that this public health, as this public health crisis continues, the escalation in hateful rhetoric against the Asian American Pacific Islander and Haredi and Orthodox individuals will continue, leading to increased tensions across New York City. And this comes on the heels of several years of anti uh, surging anti-Semitic violence, where extreme anti-Semitism online has had deadly consequences. We strongly urge the New York City Council and the Commission on Human and Civil Rights, in particular, to use its pulpit, bully pulpit, to speak out against stereotyping, scapegoating, and all forms of hate connected to the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you for your time and consideration, and we look forward to continuing to serve as a resource to the commission as it works to ensure that New York City is a safe, welcome, and inclusive city for all. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Richman. Uh, thank you for your testimony. And uh, But let me ask you one thing. As, as I said several times before, our city or society can be a better place if we all understand that we should respect each other, we should think that we have to do everything possible to make sure that everyone is respected, is treated fairly. But is there any recommendation for the city council in addressing this type of discrimination that have created division, you know, among the people who are living in New York City? Is there any recommendation that you can provide to, to I, us? I think, I think it's a matter of being sensitive and not singling out or stereotyping one particular community. We see this again and again and again uh, in, in many forums, uh, in, the, in the media, uh, with government officials, with, uh, with uh, rank and file. And uh, this, this is what leads to anti-Semitism. This is what leads to finger pointing, uh, scapegoating, and being sensitive to that and making sure that we call out individuals who are not complying with the rules, that we enforce the rules, but that we don't make this a matter of uh, whole communities that perhaps are uh, not complying uh, with the rules based on the, uh, the uh, actions of just a few. Thank you so much, very much. Thank you, have a nice day and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, and next we have Howie Yee. 
Hallie, you may begin your testimony after the sergeant has called time. Time starts now. Thank you. My name is Hallie Yee, and I'm a policy coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, or CACF, the nation's only Pan-Asian children and families advocacy organization. On behalf of our 40 plus organizational members and partners serving the diverse APA communities across New York City, we ask council today to hold our administration accountable to our community's needs. We demand that the city address mental health needs of all New Yorkers, especially those who are East Asian presenting who have been targeted during this pandemic. The system must be prepared to help our community members who have faced loss, isolation, discrimination, xenophobia, and more. The pandemic has fostered an environment of fear and uncertainty that are resulting in targeted acts of racism towards APAs. In New York specifically, East Asian presenting individuals have been subject to violent racist attacks and xenophobic representations of the virus in media. The city needs to ensure support of targeted communities of color during this crisis and moving forward. We demand an investment in community-led efforts towards data collection on incidents, inter-community healing, and positive mental health. As far as the task force that was created in response to the uptick in hate crimes, CACF does not necessarily encourage additional NYPD action as cracking down against communities often results in more harm to those of color as can be seen in the early responses to enforcing social distancing and mask rules. We are glad that the commission has begun bystander training to minimize police intervention, but our concern lies with the wraparound services provided after the fact. Second, we demand that the city can ensure that critical information gets to New Yorkers in the language that they need, as is their civil right. It is only recently that Health and Hospitals was able to translate health outreach documents into the city's top 11 languages required by local law. That was way too late and still not enough. Each agency must be prepared to reach and support families who are limited English proficient. COVID-19 has highlighted the barriers the most marginalized APAs face to language access. The mere availability of language is not enough without effective outreach and implementation of language access policies, preventing vital communication about city decisions and the pandemic from reaching the community. Lack of a culturally responsive system is harming APAs and other communities of color. The delay of disseminating and general lack of in language information about the pandemic, including social distancing guidelines, has led to a higher risk of exposure to the virus for the most vulnerable. This egregious gap in language access has led to our communities to rely once again upon the community-based organizations who serve them in the absence of proper resources by the city as CBOs act as interpreters and crowdsource translated materials regarding even the most basic of information on the pandemic. Outreach to the most marginalized pockets of the community must be prioritized as without it, their health and very lives are endangered if they are unable to communicate with their schools, their health providers and social service providers. Ensuring best practices around COVID-19 testing, language access, and response to upticks in xenophobia and hate crimes is critical in making it safe for our community's revitalization efforts. Thank you. Time expired. Thank you very much, Ms. Yi. Thank you. Have a very nice day and stay safe. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. You as well. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, if your name has not been called and you wish to testify, Please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. As there are no raised hands, I'll now turn it over to the chair for closing remarks and to gavel out and end the hearing. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so very much. I would like to uh, thank all of the participants and all of you, the wonderful people from the city council, starting from the uh, community council and also the session at ARM and all the wonderful people who make it possible for us council members to do what we have to do and to address the issues of the people. And this has been a wonderful, wonderful public hearing because discrimination and also uh, human rights they are very important issues and very important priorities for us in government, for us in the city council. And I thank all of you for your effort to make it possible today. And uh, I would like also to thank all the participants, all the members of the panel. And as I said that uh, we should continue to work together as a team to make sure that New York City is a better place for all. Thank you so very much. And may God bless you. May God protect all of you and your family especially at the very difficult, challenging time, tribulant time, because now New York City, and I can say the world, is a different place 
And everyone, regardless of who you are, everyone is facing some type of challenges, or the same challenges created by COVID-19. May God bless you and protect you. And again, thank you very much. With that, the meeting is adjourned.